Ever since setting up this electron microscope in my shop, I've wanted to make animations with it, showing video taken through the microscope. And I've also been thinking about different recording media lately. So I put the two together this weekend and came up with this. This is an animation that shows a phonograph needle riding in an LP groove. So in this video, I'm going to talk about how I made this and some other recording technologies. The first step is to head down to the local music store and pick out a few LPs from the dollar bin. And of course, the electron microscope chamber is so small I can't fit the whole record in there, so I cut off a small section. The next problem is that the electron microscope cannot image things that are electrical insulators. And the reason is that the microscope works by firing electrons at the object that you want to inspect. And if the object is an insulator, those electrons get trapped inside the object because it's an insulator. And eventually, if enough electrons get trapped there, uh, future electrons coming in will be repelled because like charges repel each other. So the way to solve this problem is to coat the object in something conductive. In this case, I mounted the pieces of record to a glass microscope slide and then loaded the slide into a vacuum chamber and evaporated some silver metal onto the uh, pieces of LP. Normally, this is done with a machine called a sputter coater, uh, but my sputter coater needs some work, so I'm using physical vapor deposition. So this is enough to image the record by itself, and I needed to prepare a stylus so that we could see the dynamics. I really wanted to see the animation of the needle flowing in the LP groove. So I also got a cheap uh, stylus and cartridge from the same music store, of course from the used needles bin. And um, most of it is plastic, and even worse, there's a couple magnets inside there. So the way this works is that the stylus vibrates because of the grooves in the LP and it moves the magnets near a coil, and that's what generates the electricity that gets amplified into the audio signal. Um, also, unfortunately, if we put this directly in the electron microscope, those magnets would deflect the electron path and distort the image. So I pulled the magnets off of the stylus. Next, I needed to make a sort of primitive tone arm that I could put inside the electron microscope chamber so that there would be some amount of tracking allowed. Uh, like a little bit of compliance so that I could push the needle into the record without it, you know, destroying the record, uh, but still have it follow the groove. So I just used a piece of copper wire and melted it into the side of the stylus and then cut away all the excess plastic. So this is what I was left with. I also noticed that there's sort of a rubber suspension on here so that the actual stylus arm is electrically isolated from everything else on the stylus, like the plastic and everything. So I added a tiny copper wire and then used conductive carbon glue to make sure that the stylus arm itself was grounded or at least electrically connected to everything else. This particular electron microscope has two separate stages inside with their own motion controls. So this allowed me to put the needle with its, you know, sort of makeshift tone arm onto one stage and then put the piece of LP that's been coated with silver onto another stage. And then I could move both of them independently so that I could arrange it uh, to make an aesthetically pleasing image. After getting everything aligned and turned on, you can see the video image that the electron microscope creates. So it is possible to get real-time imagery. This is running even at close to 60 fields per second. But the resolution in this mode is quite poor, and so is the contrast. The signal is very low. In order to make a decent image, uh, the scanning electron microscope requires about 10 seconds per frame to scan it out. So what I did was use the micrometers, the controls on the, uh, the motion controls on the stage to move the record by a very, very tiny amount, about 50 microns, and then uh, take a still frame. And I'm using my Tektronix MDO oscilloscope to store the data. So the procedure, you know, I kind of got in the rhythm of doing it. And so it's move 50 microns, take a frame, save it to the uh, USB stick, move by 50 microns, uh, take a frame, you know, save it to the stick. And so I eventually ended up with 60 frames uh, each spaced about 50 microns apart. I used a couple of felt tip marks on the CRT on the scanning electron microscope to, for, as reference points. So I, uh, since the um, position of the LP is not perfectly 90 degrees to the scope or perfectly 90 degrees to the movement axes, I was actually moving in two axes and then uh, using those marks on the screen to sort of maintain a, the, rough, the rough position of that needle would stay about the same. I processed the data from the oscilloscope in Octave, which is a, uh, an open source MATLAB alternative, and then took the images from that and processed them in Photoshop using batch processing, and then used Photoshop to create the animated GIF. The playback speed of that animated GIF is about 1 400th uh, actual speed, if the record were playing. 
As you can see, the stylus doesn't move up and down or side to side in the record groove. Since this is a stereo record, it actually has two channels of audio information encoded in one groove. So diagonal movements, sort of bottom left to top right, is one channel, and bottom right to top left is the other channel. So depending how the magnets move based on the vibrations picked up by that needle tip, uh, you can get different signals sent to each channel. So then I thought, well, this is cool. Maybe there's some other interesting recording formats I can take a look at. And yeah, just in the last week or two, my friends at Evil Mad Scientist Laboratories uh, reminded me or showed me this for the first time. This is a capacitance electronic disc, a very unusual video format that was um, developed by RCA, but was sort of a commercial failure, so they're kind of hard to find. The disc comes in this plastic caddy, and you'd put this whole caddy in the machine, and then the machine would open it up and pull out this basically video phonograph. It's, it's an analog device. It's basically, it has a track just like audio LPs do. It's just that the um, information density is so much higher, uh, the track spacing is really tight, so you can actually see the light diffraction patterns in this device. So here it is under the SEM, and I've put it next to the phonograph needle tip just for comparison. As you can see, the track density is incredibly tighter and uh, the method of storage is not quite the same. Whereas on an audio record, the needle is actually vibrated by physical cuts in the track. On this capacitance electronic disc, it's actually the depth of the track that makes uh, the signal. And the needle doesn't really move up and down so much as the capacitance between the needle and the disc changes. Interestingly, this, this capacitive electronic disc is somewhat conductive and uh, the capacitance between it and the needle is measured, and as it spins around, the track uh, thickness varies, or the trench depth almost varies. So as it spins, you get this signal correlated with the capacitance change as it goes around. It sounds incredibly difficult to do technically, and indeed it took RCA from the late 60s all the way to the early 80s to get this out. And by that time, VHS, Beta, and even Laserdisc had pretty much, you know, toasted it. So this format was dead on arrival, and RCA lost apparently hundreds of millions of dollars. I also wanted to take a look at a CD-ROM, and these are read with a laser, of course, but we can't just put this in the electron microscope either, even though the, the metal is aluminum. It's behind plastic, so on this side it's just polycarbonate on the surface, and on this side it's this protective lacquer label. So if we put this into the SEM either side up, all we'd see is a smooth surface, if anything, because there's actually no bumps on the surface. That's, that's good, because it protects the media. So I spent a long time trying to figure out how to expose the aluminum part. At first, I cut off a small bit and put this into uh, methylene chloride, and that dissolves the polycarbonate base really well, and you're left with this very thin, almost falling apart piece of uh, aluminum that has the, the uh, pattern printed into it. Uh, but I had problems with a trace amount of um, plastic being left on the surface, and it was just so curled up it didn't work. Anyway, I tried a bunch of other things, and then I found out the thing that works best is just double stick tape. Just get some really strong uh, double stick tape and stick it down to the top of the disc and pull it off. And now we have a, a really fresh sample of aluminum here. And so if you come in with a multimeter, this is actually quite conductive. This is bare aluminum exposed. So here's what the CD-ROM looks like. And of course, this is a digital format, so instead of having a track vary in, in width or depth, it, the track is predefined, and then there's pits and uh, lands carved into it. Of course, the width of this is even smaller than the ridiculous capacitive electronic disc. We're down to about a 500 nanometer wide pit, and I think the track uh, spacing is about 1.6 micron. Of course, I also wanted to take a look at a DVD, and so unlike a CD-ROM that has the aluminum layer and a protective lacquer on one side, the DVD is built sort of like a sandwich, where it's got the polycarbonate discs on the top and the bottom, and the aluminum information layer is in the middle. So to get at the aluminum, we just separate the two parts, and then that exposes the raw aluminum surface. The track spacing on this DVD is only about 700-something nanometers, and this is getting near the limit of the resolution that I can pull out of my scanning electron microscope, in its current condition at least. Okay, see you next time. Bye.